introduce you to our third and last speaker of this evening, Mr. Chris Ekene Emba. He is a researcher at the Center for Peace and Studies uh, of Toronto, Tromso, Norway. Yeah, that's what I say. He has years of experience as a social political analyst. He has worked um, as in the media sector. He has worked in the, the African Statement magazine. He is also a guest columnist for teaching newspaper for no, a guest columnist for leading newspaper in Nig Nigeria. His focus is social political development, investigative research in Norway. He is also a volunteer journalist in for Utropia, which is a leading newspaper in Tromsø. He's also a volunteer for the Red Cross, Amnesty International, United Nations Association. Please, ladies and gentlemen, give a very warm welcome for Mr. Chris Ekene Emba. Is it working now? Okay. I guess uh, what I will say here has been so much overflogged by various speakers from Tuesday when I came here to present, and uh, of course everybody shared different opinions on the same issue. But first of all, let me start with the diagram there. That is the Peace, uh, Peace Studies uh, Center, uh, in front of Peace Studies Center, University of Tromso. It symbolizes, uh, uh, that's Mohammed Gandhi from India. Um, and of course, if you know the history of uh, Mohammed Gandhi, he is known for non-violent approach to uh, peace, not the violent approach. So uh, largely many of us in the University of Toronto from peace and conflict transformation have that orientation of non-violent approach to peace. And uh, it's, uh, it seems that most, uh, most speakers so far has focused so much on security approach to peace. Security approach to peace implies uh, the use of force, whether by the government, whether by mission, UN missions, African missions to achieve peace. And uh, we have uh, realized so far that insofar as force is used to fight force, it has never worked. And uh, Maha, Johan Gansong is a very prominent uh, peace scholar from Norway, once said that violence begets violence. So the approach of uh, the use of force by uh, uh, government and security forces has never really helped to institutionalize peace, a sustainable kind of peace, particularly in conflict regions of Africa. Well, my focus, uh, uh, the title of my uh, presentation, as, as is on the, on the screen there, is uh, Politics and the Legion of Peace, the Dynamics and Challenges of Security in Africa in 21st Century, a classical case of Nigeria. I, I used Nigeria, for, first of all, I'm a Nigerian. I've done so much research on Nigeria, and uh, I know a lot about the conflict in Nigeria, if not everything. I've lived with the people as a researcher. Of course, if you study these people, you know how they behave. You need to integrate into the society for you to be able to get the real facts of every conflict. As most of the conflicts are, most of the conflicts you have in Nigeria has been interpreted so far as religious conflicts, uh, political conflicts, ethnic clash, everything. That is quite true. But we must always realize that for every conflict, there must always be a header. There must be always be a reason why that conflict has to go on. In the Naya Delta, it was a question of marginalization of the people, of the Naya Delta people. Now, the question of Boko Haram. People have said they want to Islamize Nigeria. But from what I will read here, we say that that is not really the case. I will focus more on uh, the failure of leadership as the result of the conflict. Now, uh, of course, we know Africa is, uh, Africa's dilemma is too multidimensional, multifarious, and requires so many explanations from various angles. Nigeria, particularly, is a giant uh, of Africa, but it's a giant filled with comparative elites, a giant of weak economic and political structures, of a poverty-induced development and fiscal policies, a giant military characterized with brutality and abuse of rights of Nigerians. It's also a giant filled with helpless youths, 
with unfulfilled dreams, even when they have the capacity. Nigeria has indeed, to an extent, failed. Uh, the final phase of that impending doom, which we don't pray for, might just be what the country is witnessing at present. That is the rise of insurgency, the rise of Boko Haram. Boko Haram, we know, has been in existence for, for a very long time. But at present, it seems their actions have, be, have become true, 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 uh, too uh, uh, threatening to the survival of the Nigerian state. That Nigeria, particularly from the closing years of the 20th century, has been under siege by various militant groups under different disguises is no longer news at all. That, the, that Nigeria has been held hostage by a cabal like group juggled between the military and the civilians from the late 70s to date is an established fact. We all know that. However, what can be regarded as news is which among the groups, the militants or the cabal like leaders in government constitutes the greatest threat in, at every point in time in Nigeria's social political development. Going by, going by Nigeria antecedent from the middle of the 1980s, both groups has competed for space in Nigeria dilemma history. Why the country has rotated men that has only plundered the economy more than built it, dominance among the dissidents or militant groups has rotated. Of course, we you know in the night in the early, early, late 80s we have the mighty uprising down up north. In the in the uh, in the late uh, 90s we have the Odua People's Congress in the southwest, and then of course in the millenn new millennium from 2000 or so we have uh, the Niger Delta Volunteer Force and uh, movement for the emancipation of Niger Delta people threatening from the Niger Delta, and of course uh, uh, lately we've had. Uh, the Boko Haram people now threatening. And we must be, I must make one thing clear, that the conflicts from the Niger, or the threat from the Niger Delta region subsided was not necessarily because of the joint military force that Nigeria pushed to that area. It was basically because of the amnesty program that the late President Musa Yeodua granted the boys, boys of the Greece, we do call them in Nigeria. He would grant them, he asked them, he brought them to Abuja and asked them to lay down their arms and they were granted state pardon and subsequently they were asked what they want to do and so many various skilled acquisition programs were established. Some of them were sent down here in Germany, some were sent to Asian countries, some were in Nigeria acquiring some skills to empower themselves. But of course, they have said so the Naya Delta. What happens to the, north, to the youth of the North who are helpless? Baba, uh, Baba is a, 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 a theorist of social, a new social movement. He once posited that individuals or groups resort to joining sets as one of the alternative responses expressed to alleviate stresses and pains of others. Others as used in this context refer to states, groups, or individuals whose activities have remained a threat to the former survival and interest. Once it, is, once it becomes potentially dangerous to coexist in such environments, individuals begin to look for alternative means to respond to alleviate the pain, cause, to alleviate the pain perceived to have been caused by the other. Boko Haram set under the banner of religion, which lately has assumed a counter state actor in Nigeria, resorted to violence as one of the several alternatives to alleviate stresses and pressures arising from the widespread economic deprivation. Mark that word, widespread economic deprivation of inflicted by, by the Nigerian state, more precisely by its leadership. Also supporting this view held by Go, by Baba, Gore in 1970 in his relative depri deprivative theory has opined that those who are the most uh, frustrated either in absolute, absolute terms or in, rel in relative to the expectation are the most likely to participate in conflict. It goes by saying that therefore that deprivation perceived or imagined remains a potential source of conflict in Africa. To be sure, much like uh, a Niger Delta Volunteer Force and men, Boko Haram shares no millennium ideology. They shares no apocalyptic core political ideology at all. They have no desire to, uh, for external goals or higher goals other than to better their lives. Or much like the groups like uh, Al-Qaeda Network, like the Taliban group, uh, they live within the society, recruit members within the society, and, and are not inundated with grandiose leaders. 
The argument that the group in, are inundated by charismatic leaders at best is too simplistic and unempirical and does not take into cognizance the economic framework of Nigeria State, which to an extent has failed. If the groups attack in, uh, of course, the, the rise in terrorist attacks of the group started in 2009. Now the question is, is, if the group's attack was as a result of the grandest leader, leadership of Yusuf, because Yusuf was assumed to be a very charismatic man who, who has the power to influence the youths. If the group's uh, uh, terrorist attack in, 20, in 2009 was, can be attributed to this one man, what happens to the late attacks? Of course, under the feeble leaders, who many of them, as far as I know, cannot read and write. So, the question of grandiose leaders is, for me, baseless. The three militant, group, the three militant groups I mentioned here, talking about MEND, Nigeria Nye Volunteer Force, and Boko Haram, have carried out attacks at, as, against the Nigerian state. Boko Haram violent attacks cannot be separated in context from Operation Barbarossa and the oil war declared by MEND in 2008. Men declared what was called Operation Barbarossa. They declared to bomb all oil installations in the Nigeria Delta. Considering the fact that that is the only way they can attack the states, they decided okay, we are going to call our, operation, our, our attack against the state Operation Barbarossa. And that was gotten from something uh, in the Second World War somehow, somewhere in, in, in Germany here where it, uh, an operation was, declared, was called Operation Barbarossa and so many attacks was carried out. Men, men and Niger Delta Volunteer Force focused on acts of sabotage, theft, destruction of properties, guerrilla warfare, and kidnapping to press their demand. Boko Haram can be accused of similar offenses, but the, the magnitude, here comes the difference. The magnitude of civilian casualties in its attack in churches, mosques, and other places has separated its terrorism in context from that of men and um, Niger, Niger Delta Volunteer Force. The three militant groups ta both targeted and bombed police stations. That, no doubt. But uh, Boko Haram went as far as bombing the Nigerian headquarters, or the Nigerian police headquarters, which to an extent has separated its terrorism in context from that of men. From that of men. Now, the question, it should also be noted that men did not limit their activity to, activities to Nigeria Delta. Men carried up to the, up, men followed the, south, the coastal area up to Lagos in the southwest. Because there was, a, there, was, there was a news that, the, the, that uh, an oil installation was bombed in Lagos, and men declared that they were the bomb ones that bombed the, 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 the oil installation. In other words, they have moved away from, just like Boko Haram, which, has, which was started in Bono State, has moved from the, practically from the north down to Abuja now to start attacking the state. Men tried as much as possible also to move along the coast because we call them, like I said, we call them boys of the Greeks. And when you call boys of the Greeks, they, can, they know the water, the, the water roots much more than you, much more than many of us who are not really used to the river areas. So, you know, you know, in other words, the attack by, the, the bomb attack on Nigeria by uh, Boko Haram, uh, as far as I know, was, and also the, uh, the one, the, the attack, first of all, the army barracks in January, 2011, they attacked the UN building on the, they bombed the police headquarters on 16 June 2011, they bombed the uh, UN building on, on August 26, 2011, they bombed the, uh, lately, they, on 16th November, they bombed the uh, police uh, divisional headquarters in Yobe State, not in that part of Nigeria, and also they bombed so many other parts, so many other, other, other police stations. That to an extent, uh, apart from that, they are target, like I said, they are target of churches and mosques makes their acts to an extent different from, from that of men in terms of magnitudes of casualties. These bomb, these bomb attacks, like I said earlier, are both symbolic and strategic. In addition to the alternative, alternative response theory, the attacks, the attacks aims at humiliate, humiliating, as far as I know, the leadership of the Nigerian state in the international community and perhaps draw further the attention of the world to the true Nigerian state. Not the blissful Nigeria, it's a least speak of in international gathering, and not necessarily that of the international media hype, because international media most time try to get involved with some kind of uh, media. Uh, Boko Haram is Western education is a sin. Boko Haram said they want to Islamize, Islamize Nigeria. Those are, those are not, or it is only empirical. You need to be in the field, in, talk to these boys, know what their grievances are, then before you can make an assessment or judgment of, on why they, are bomb, why, they are why they are bombing, where they are bombing. Boko Haram does not imply, Boko Haram, like most media, Western media will say, is a sin, is, cannot be supported by any evidence. 
Boko Haram uses the gun made by the Western world. Many of these Boko Haram uses cars, even though they are brought by politicians, made by West, Western world. Many of, some, some of them can, to an extent, read and write. So what is the, base, what is the basic of saying Western education is a sin? If you, want to, if you want to do away with everything Western, do away with everything Western. Fight the Nigerian state with, with bow and arrow, which was the pre-African way of fighting. Then we know that you are really talking about Western education is a sin. But for the fact they use cars, for the fact they use guns made, by, made in this Western world, for the fact they use, uh, I mean, they use phone to an extent made by the Western world, it does not, it's, bas it's just, it's baseless to say that the extent, but because of, uh, it has been interpreted, Boko Haram is a, uh, a Western education is forbidden, and the media, international media capitalized on that, that does not support the whole essence or existence of Boko Haram and its terrorist attack on Nigeria. Now, I want, I'm going to go down to an extent to an African context. Uh, Nigeria, or in, to an extent, the larger African se se security cannot be considered in isolation, but as part of the overall framework of leadership. Uh, like a former uh, national security advisor in Nigeria once said, uh, he said that the current situation, the cor the, the, uh, uh, he, he attributed the current situation to weak, the current uh, uh, conflict situation in Nigeria to weak economy, religion, uh, labor and politics, which has been, which was, has been, which has to an extent has been bastardized that the people, particularly the youths, have become so hopeless, so helpless, not hopeless, so helpless that they had no alternative than to just resort to whatever means to, of survival. With the bad opportunist and wish hunting politics, politics which has characterized politicking in Nigeria, one cannot totally be aghast with the, with the silence of northern politicians because people have said, why are northern politicians not talking? Why are northern politicians not stopping these men fraud, stopping these boys? That these are the only people uh, uh, Boko Haram members can hear. These are the only people they can listen to. Now, the question is this. In Nigeria, uh, I'm sure many of us, maybe after this, you have to pick a little interest in Nigeria. Uh, it is much better to keep silent in such situations uh, there are certain things we consider political sin in Nigeria. If you really want to function, I'm not really suggesting it's a good idea, though. If you really want to function in Nigerian political sin, I think sometimes being very much silent in certain aspects of uh, national life is much better than talking. Because sometimes you talk, your fellow politicians will hold it against you. Sometimes you talk when it becomes, uh, when it's anti-government, -gov anti particularly the government in power. Once you talk or behave in such a way that does not support the existing government, there's trouble. Because I, rem I remember the before, the night, before the April 2011 election, th this, there was this king contest between the incumbent acting president then, President John Goodluck Jonathan, our pre current president, and then a former fr president, uh, Ibrahim Babanida. Then uh, on October 1st, 2010, the, the men bombed Abuja. Uh, that's on our, on our independence day anniversary. There was uh, by, uh, the media, the, the campaign director of uh, Ibrahim Babanjida was immediately arrested because he was accused of having some interaction with men. Uh, in other words, he is part of the group that bombed Abuja. But after everything, I mean, it was clear that what the existing government did was simply to see how far they can subdue IBB's campaign. I am not a supporter of IBB as far as I know. I'm not a supporter of Ibrahim Babanjida coming to rule Nigeria again. He was in Nigeria. He, was, he came to Nigeria through Kubeata, Kubeata, between August 23, 1985 till June or so 1992, before he handed over to the entire government. He, he, to an extent, he contributed in messing up the whole country. But, but at the same time, he's a Nigerian who has, who has right to context. We, the voters, to an extent, are supposed to be the one who will kick him out all the time. We don't need you in, in government house not a government official because of the incumbent factor. You ha now, the, now what they did was to, carry, it was to arrest IBB campaign director based on the fact that he owns a very big media, media the fact the largest, the, the largest private media company in Africa, the AI, AIT. The IKB, IBB to an extent has used that, that platform, media platform to campaign. So what they did now was to arrest this man to an extent hinder IBB's campaign strategies and eventually, when it, was, when it was obvious that IBB, uh, to an extent, his campaign, uh, his campaign has relaxed a bit, knowing fully that he's not going to go back to gov government house, uh, uh, Raymond Okwesi was released. 
was not was not was not charged was in fact if was even if he was charged he was not accused of anything he was acquitted for nothing because he was acquitted at the exact time that uh, uh, that uh, it was obvious that IDB would get nowhere in other words what i'm trying to paint the picture i'm trying to paint here is sometimes in nigeria at least for now we hope change will come that being silent sometimes is in, in when it comes to political in the political arena being silent sometimes is good for them, you know. Now, practically speaking, Niger the people have also said that they try to give it, a, like I, I try to explain now, try to give Boko Haram, interpret, Boko Haram insurgency some kind of political interpretation. We have to understand political, uh, Boko Haram uh, political interpretation, whatever, from the angle of polit politicians from the north, who to an extent, like I told my friend, much, I think it was yesterday, who, to an extent, who wants to bolster their political credibility and fortunes, tries to instigate these boys, try to play this kind of dilemma religious game with them, to tell them, hey, we, we are with you guys. We want to ensure that Nigeria is Islamized. We want to ensure that we practice, I mean, what we have coined as Sharia crazy in Nigeria. And these boys, of course, they know that these men are also part of their problem. They're also part of the people who has impoverished them. But because of the incentives that come with such instigation because of the incentives that come in form in terms of money i remember most of these remember most of most members of this book around many of them are poor so you don't if you're speaking to a poor man and you have some dollars in your hands he will consider even you much more than that government that has so much promise that has done nothing to alleviate their pains then uh, like i said here the political elites in power have misplaced Priorities in running Nigerian state are more, more, in a larger, in, more in a larger context, the African states. In place of good, good uh, political framework that would take into cognizance the yearning and aspirations of the people, African leaders have institution, institutionalized corruption and bad governance. In the face of this redeemable, I say redeemable because it's, this situation is quite, unavo it's quite avoidable, but it, we can't just avoid it because of the presence of our recycled leaders. The youth resorts to violence as the only alternative means left to express frustration within the existing order. The brutality of the government forces as a countermeasure has only resulted to more violence, as was the case with, like I said, with boys of the Greek in, in Niger Delta, and at best confirms government failure at discharging its vital security functions. Instead of focusing on people, people uh, uh, instead of focusing on resort to written inv investigation to cop the rising terrorist, act terrorist activities in the, in the country, I mean Nigeria, this time around, the government has su successfully played politics with militancy. Boko, this Boko Haram, uh, uh, considering the aspect of violence in Nigeria, and more specifically the, 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 more specifically the menace of Boko Haram activities and the inability of the security apparatus of Nigeria state to live up to expectations, one can postulate that the end is not yet in sight for conflicts in Nigeria, and by, by implication, security of lives and property are not guaranteed, at least in the interim, in Nigerian states. Before the activities of Boko Haram became well pronounced, other militant groups were terrorizing, were terrorizing Nigeria. Like I said, we have the men who, that terrorize Nigeria. We have the Old Republic Congress from the Southwest that terrorize Nigeria. We have the Niger Delta Volunteer Force that terrorize Nigeria. We have so many other, so many other fraction of militants, militant groups that terrorize Nigeria. So, uh, without sounding too pessimistic, but hinging my assertion on reason and sound, ju and sound judgment of Nigeria's precarious situation, more groups might be in the offing to carry on with the militant legacy on the Nigerian state if adequate measures are not taken to tackle, the, to tackle militancy, and more importantly, tackle this time around, tackle the developmental crisis which has raided the nation, because that is the root of Nigerian problem. Nigerian problem is not militancy. No, no, or a, a, no a, an average Nigeria, that's what we normally say, uh, a very a philosophical, a, philosophy, a philosopher and also a musician in Nigeria, is a well across the globe. It's called Fela. He has, he has this music he called Suffering, suffering and Smiling. We, ha we are used, used to some kind of suffering and smiling situation. So an average Nigeria loves to live. An average Nigeria would not want to carry a gun if he has an alternative to live. On, on the leadership front, uh, it is not out of place to uh, paraphrase one of Nigerian sociopolitical novelists, Shinua Ashabe's exposition on the, on the situation in Nigeria and more in a larger context more, and in Africa, and use it as a reference point to qualify the Nigerian situation. 
Ashebe opined that the trouble with Africa, of course with Nigeria also, is simply and squarely the failure of leadership. He continued, there is, uh, there is nothing basically wrong with African land or climate or, coll or collective psych or anything else. Instead, African problem is the heartless unwillingness and unacceptable inability of its leaders to rise to the responsibilities and challenges of personal example, which remains the hallmarks of leadership. Going further, he asserts, without peace, no meaningful social program can be undertaken. Without, just, without, justice, social, without justice, social order is constantly threatened. And the reason is simple. A normal, sensible person in the, in the, in the typical Nigerian scenario at this point in time will simply wait for his turn to come so long as the shear of the load will go around. Because that is what the politicians do. They will keep waiting by the side, keep trying to see how they will put the present government down. Not necessarily because they want to go and act. Not necessarily because they want to go and in, get themselves involved in some proactive reform that will, ch that will change the life of the youth and make them accept you know, better alternatives to guns and bombs. I said that also, military, but military brutality and militant brutality are two sides of a coin. State brutality cannot stop, but rather led to prolif proliferation of militancy and the larger population of Nigeria states will be both the victims and the casualties. The same applies to virtual African states. I know what is happening in Somalia. I know the piracy. I've, not, I've, I've, not, I've traveled to an extent many African countries, but I have not been to Somalia. But I know that uh, I've read some books that some of the youths are saying, look, if you have an alternative means, alternative means to life, livelihood, we won't want to risk our life in, in, in the sea even if we know how to swim. They have said that openly, but because of so many clash of interest in, both in the government of course, and of course the rebels, the problem persisted. On the political front, this, in this case Nigeria, and to an extent maybe African states, political opportunities might not stop trying to instigate the youth to violence because of the incentives that accompany such unhealthy relationship. But once economic deprivation of the youth are taken care of, the letter, the letter, I mean this, this time, I mean the youths, can no longer rely, the, the, I mean the politicians can no longer rely on the youths who are already empowered for better lives without the guns and the bombs. As the saying goes, I'm, now, I'm trying to, here now, I'm trying to get focus on the peaceful approach to peace and harmonious diversity. Because people have talked about so much on security approach to peace. The use of force against force in any place has not brought about peace in any country, whether here in Europe or elsewhere. Now, Foc with focus on, uh, on peaceful approach to peace. As the saying goes, if you want peace, then give to others what they want that you also want. If you want to live in a, if you want to live in a very calm society, ensure that you conduct yourself in such a way that your next door neighbor will live in that calm society. If you want love, give your next door, not, not your next door neighbor love. If, you're living, if you have, if you're in authority to provide the means of livelihood to your next door neighbor, provide that because if in a society where you have a, a very big gap between the rich and the poor, the rich definitely cannot be sleeping with the two eyes closed. That, I'm, that I know. There is, this is the whole essence, uh, concept of Ubuntu. I mean, some of my South, well, East, and West, East and Southern African friends will know the whole meaning of Ubuntu. The indigenous African peace mechanism, that, this is the whole S concept of Ubuntu, the indigenous African peace mechanisms and the most sustainable route to peace and security by peaceful means. Having said this, not going to the route to resolve the, the, resol to resolve the de developmental crisis that has rocked the African nations, like Niger Nigeria State myself, and instead focus on the use of state force has led to superior of violence and counter-violence as events have shown. Thus, thus, only an equitable Nigeria, and by extension also, only in equitable African states, we, f we find peace and security, not in an African state of 10 million years and 10 million beggars. This is what an assertion of a, a very a well-known Kenyan politician said. Okay, my Kenyan friend is not here again. Uh, Joshua Moeki or something. He said that you know, at the time in Kenya, that Kenya lived, it was a society of 10 million beggars with 10 million, 10 million years and 10 million beggars. You can, you, you, you can see the difference. 10 million beggars and 10 million, 10 million, million years. Then, Till then, till when we change things like this, every Nigerian, every African, both the leaders who started the fire, but are now cannot put it out, or the militants 
who are becluttered to see the insanity of the violent approach to their demands. And lastly, millions of Africans, of, of other helpless Africans, remains the casualties of state failure, as far as I know. At the, uh, of course, also at the, continent, at the continental level, even though he was not speaking in the context of Africa, but of England and other shows too in the 17th century, African leaders have thus become the classical expressions of the personalities satirized by John Wilmot, second Earl of Rochester, who pregnantly aff affirms that here lies our sovereign lords and king. And this is the better description of African leaders this time around. I haven't, I haven't said all this. I remember, I'm an op optimistic African, but I have to accept my reality first before looking for a way ahead. Uh, John Wilmot asserts that here lies our sovereign lords and kings whose promises none rely, relies on. He never said a foolish thing, nor ever did a wise one. No doubt, leaders in Africa perceived themselves as sovereign lords and kings by, by personifying office and failed to distinguish between their personalities and office of the state they occupy. They are not, only tr they are not truthful and virtually lack credibility and hence are not accountable to anyone. They are, only mo they are morally bankrupt, inept, arrogant, inconsiderate, and incurably corrupt. The love, wisdom, and, and most pitifully are all afraid to take steps that might demand them to show exceptional courage by remaining resolute in their convictions. Like, uh, I, I, uh, like uh, at present also, African leaders who are bent on hanging on to power at all costs and for the purpose of primitive accumulation has perfected the act of political expediency. Election manipulation, my friends from Zimbabwe, you can confirm how uh, uh, from the, uh, Mugabe has tried as much as possible to manipulate so whatever goes on in Zimbabwe to remain in power. We from Nigeria, we know how much we try to, uh, uh, election has been rigged because by our leaders just because they want to remain in power. Not only that, a frequent amendment of the constitution and privatized army, even when this act threatens the stability of the African states. However, the present, here comes my positive mindedness now. However, the present appalling situation in Africa cannot be and will never be our final phase. Norway, which I have been for a very long time, but not really a long time, less than a year now, from the beginning of the 19th century was a very poor nation. Norway was a poor nation. But it took Norway strong institutions and very pragmatic, pragmatic leaders to rise to where they are today. Today, Norway remains the most, uh, the country with the highest, I'm sure, with the highest human development index. Proactive leaders and strong institutions are exactly what Africa needs now for sustainability and peace. The present crop of leaders are dragging the continent further into a pit of conflict, poverty and, poverty and insecurity, leaving African economy at the mercy of the West. Mm -hmm. Here, listen again. Leaving African economy at the mercy of the West, America and the Britain wounds, uh, uh, talking about the IMF and the uh, World Bank. The rate of, of underdevelopment and insecurity in Africa in this 21st century more precisely in Nigeria, of course, in so many Af other African states, is not totally different from what was obtainable when we are still suffocated or held under the clause of military dictators. Many states in Africa are still preoccupied with one form of conflict or the other, or the other as a result of excessive power policies of our political actors at the detriment of the, power po of the body policy, talking about a society that yearns for development. The result of this power intoxication by African leaders is purely retrogressive dragging the continent further into a pit of conflict, poverty, and insecurity. African leaders need to work hard, not only to, to improve basic social infrastructures for development and empowerment, and empowerment of the youths, but also to claim a place in the Committee of Nations. This cannot happen, I repeat, this cannot happen if the continent continue to be partners in AIDS. People have suggested about the issue of AIDS, that uh, AIDS can help us, AIDS can, can help us, AIDS can do this, can, it can do that. For me, I stand by what I believe in. There is no AIDS that doesn't come with its consequences. There is no AIDS you can accept and be able to dictate how it is used. Whoever is giving you AIDS must surely dictate how the money or whatever is giving you is being used. This cannot happen if the like I said, this cannot happen if the continent remains uh, continues to be partners in aid with the West and America rather than partners in progress. Or can such scenario of equality emerge if the center periphery structures we have in the Committee of Nations continue to exist, even much more emphasized? First steps to solution cannot be found in the West. First steps to solution Af to African conflict and development cannot be found in the West. Cannot be found in America. It can only be found in Africa. The only way to it is for us to be able to get visionary leaders 
who we were able to take into consideration, into cognizance, the yearns of this youth, the youth that wants to be empowered. They don't need you to give them money. They don't need you to, tell, to, to pay them salary. The, only, the, the majority of the youths, at least in Nigeria where I live, and so many other West African countries I have visited, majority of them only yearns to be empowered, to be, to, they yearn for some kind of, start this, a kind of capacity building to empower these youths, and you have peace. That is the truth. No doubt, like I said here now, no nation can exist in isolation. There are better ways Africa can relate with the West. Better ways, really. We can, we, can be engage, we can engage with them, with the West, in the area of technical assistance. Talking about technical transfers, uh, one of the speakers mentioned that before, before now. For example, in the, uh, technical assistance, for example, in the, area of, in the area of agriculture, to maximize our potentials in that critical sector, and at least, at least avert the persistent food insecurity. Some months back, we had how thousands died in Somalia, stroke some other places because of uh, drought or, st or stuff like that. Or stuff like that you know? uh, so if we can get some kind of technical transfer in the area of, in the area of uh, agriculture, I'm sure Africa can be very so self-sustainable self in that area. And major majority of the youth will be engaged. We can also engage with the West in the area of best expertise of exploration of African vast resources, how to grow the economy and rise above or be minimally fed by Britain Woods. Having said this, though I'm not an economist, but I know it doesn't make an economic sense, that I'm sure of, it doesn't make an economic sense to borrow one dollar from IMF or from World Bank and repay the loan with $25. For me, it's baseless. Thank you very much. Thank you. I would like to know if there is any question or comment. Thank you very much. Gozichi from Nigeria. I must commend you for this detailed um, um, research on um, politics and the illusion of peace, challenges of security in Africa, a classical case of Nigeria. There is no doubt that we have a, a leadership problem in Nigeria. And uh, the root cause of most of these conflicts, we also we want to attribute to the leadership failure. However, I have just two basic concerns which I would like you to explain more. Mm -hmm. It has to do with first your comment on, I mean your implied support to some politicians who keep quiet in the face of things when things go wrong. Maybe because they want to, they don't want to be, you know, attacked or they don't want any government to to uh, maybe um, in fact they don't want any government to really come against them and uh, I will really ask is that the best way because the work of rebuilding Nigeria is in the hands of all Nigerians is that the best way to confront the particular situation we have for these politicians to keep quiet because I know that thank God you mentioned uh, um, some other militants attacks like the MENG, we have the Odudua uh, conference, yeah. we have the the Mosop, yeah, maybe, yeah. and we have all these groups, they have leaders. And I remember, they, ha they keep, they speak up even in the face of danger. And uh, eventually, somebody like uh, the Odudua People's Congress, Adams. Adams, uh, yeah. Adams is yeah, yeah. like a no. A, I wouldn't want to write him off as a nobody, but ordinarily he, he did, he's not even. I don't think he went to school, but because he stood his ground and became the mobilized these people, you know, in support of a, the particular ideology. Adams is now being celebrated in Yoruba land. In fact, he is now me, meeting people at the international level, even at our national level. Federal, federal government calls him for negotiation. So what I'm trying to say is that is that the best way our, our so-called political leaders should react? Or do you think because they are compromised in, in those issues, they don't want to speak up? And, and secondly, um, I don't know whether you want to respond. Okay, no problem. Okay. Yeah, secondly, my concern now is also, you mentioned about the, peacef the peaceful resolution of issues, especially uh, security issues. And I want to give an, uh, I want you to explain more on the issue of Boko Haram. Now, we all know that the federal government of Nigeria 
has been uh, handling this issue of Boko Haram with, you know, um, carelessly. How would I put it? Everybody knows that the they've been trying to seek for political resolution to this matter. The federal government has been very reluctant to take action, even in the face of danger. It only took some recent attack, even when the UN um, building yeah. was bombed. We expected that the government should take you know, decisive action. People were, it was burning, yet they were like trying to, I don't know, we were at a point we felt they had some hidden agenda. So we, were, we, we didn't re really like the way they responded. It only took the, the December, 25th December attack on Christians, and these are helpless, innocent citizens that has nothing to do with bad leadership. They have been bombing uh, uh, churches, they have been bombing mosques, at a, on a particular day, over, more, over a thousand Nigerian citizens have died. And now I will want you to throw more light on how you want federal government to a peace, use peaceful means to start negotiating with these people. At this, at this particular level, where the life and the security of every Nigerian is in danger. Okay. So that is why I want you to to ex you. explain, or do you think there will definitely be a, a security approach to the solution before any other political or diplomatic means to the solution? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. First of all, uh, uh, I want to comment on the question of uh, the silence of politicians. Ordinarily, it's too, it's too cowardice to be quiet in the face of danger, especially when you know you can speak out. But when you are guided by a certain ulterior motive in your quest for political office, you would just certainly do whatever is necessary to just get that office. That is what I mean by when I say that they, are, they keep quiet in the face of danger. They don't, they don't so, some of, like President Jonathan said it some days back that we have members, supporters of Boko Haram at National Assembly. We have some supporters of Boko Haram in the executive. We have members, supporters of Boko Haram in, 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 the, uh, in the State House of Assembly and elsewhere. Why, if they have, why are these supporters so faceless? Mm. That is the question. If, if not out of cowardice, if not out of what they stand to gain, because it, 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 it has become a game of waiting. I will keep waiting and keep pretending as if nothing is wrong till it gets to my turn. That has always been the question. For me, for me, I, like I remember some, before the April, 20, April uh, I was telling uh, uh, Mike or so, before the 20, 2011 election, I wrote a piece in, on, a, on November 4th, precisely, November 4th, 2010, what I tr where I tried to measure the, the uh, he, his name is President Goodluck Jonathan. But I felt that his good, his good luck has dropped completely, that he should stop living on good luck and then focus on pragmatic leadership. And uh, what I did in that piece was to tell Nigerian voters, vote, don't vote this man because, he's a, because his name is good luck. He doesn't have good luck again. We don't even need a man with good, good, good luck to, to, to preside over 150, 180 million Nigerians. We need, some, we need a leader, not somebody who lives on luck. And I, I've got, I got threats for daring to, uh, my little self, got threats for daring to, to, to talk about the president on, on, on the face of newspapers. That is, one, that, is, that is me speaking. I mean, I mean, I can just be taken away by th those men if they really care. To. Of course, I went underground for some weeks after that. My boss asked me to go home and don't come to the office for some time which I did. Now, we have the politicians who are not necessarily guide by, guided by some kind of moral incentives to be in power, who are not necessarily guided by the quest to, 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 to better the loss of Nigeria, but rather guided by ulterior motives over the nation and keep plundering the economy as much as they can. It's a question of wait for your turn. Like Ashabi stated in, 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 the, rise, in, the, in the, the problem with Nigeria, Wait for, see, wait for your turn, get to the office, grab your turn, and grab as much as you can and go. That is the mindset of these politicians. We, we, have, we have seen as much as possible when so many well-known economists, well-known politicians who really, who really wants to better the loss of Nigeria are, came out to contest, but they are pulled down by the powers that be who are not really willing to help. So it's a question of cowardice on the, part of, on, the, on the part of the politicians, not necessarily as a way out. I don't support that myself. Then on the question of peaceful approach to peace, other than the security approach with regard to many times, with regard to Boko Haram, you made mention of uh, Boko Haram uh, being um, 
talking Christians. I'm a Christian myself, a very strong one indeed. But it, yeah, Boko, Haram, uh, Boko Haram should be uh, the, the idea of attaching so much religious, in, religious, uh, in, uh, 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 religious uh, whatever to Boko Haram should be, should be minimized. If Boko, uh, I'm not justifying violence here, please, but if Boko Haram has an option, Niger Delta Volunteer Force meant has, has an option to, to bomb oil installations, which, which was the backbone of the Nigerian economy then, I've, I've, of course, up to now. They had the option of going through the, through the coast up to the southwest to bomb the oil installations. That, to an extent, is terrorism. Boko Haram, go up the north. How many federal structures do you have in the north? How many can you count of? None. Do you have any, any oil installation in the north? None. So somehow, there must be a way to get to, get to Nigeria nation. I am not justifying violence, please. Get me right. I am not justifying in any way violence. But there must be a way these men can get to the Nigerian states. And they feel the way is to at least bomb the UN building to humiliate Nigeria, bomb the Nigerian police headquarters to humiliate Nigeria. And that, that is, is just almost like what men was doing in Nigeria, bombing the oil installations from where oil is pumped that, that generates revenue to Nigeria. Having said this, please don't misquote me. I am not a supporter of violence. Militant violence, state brutality remains the same. The only way out, like what you have in the Niger Delta, you know, you were in Nigeria. The joint military tracks were got tired of, of men and his group. What, what brought about relative peace in the Niger Delta? Was it not the amnesty program that, 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 uh, that General Yadwa instituted? Without the amnesty program, I'm, I can bet you that problems in the Niger Delta, to an extent, we continue because they have, like you have faceless politicians funding the Boko Haram, you also have faceless politicians, I don't, want, I don't want to call names, funding men and Niger Delta volunteer force. Many of these men, how can they import arms? Do they have the resources to import arms? Somebody has to import, import these arms, pay them to use it, to, to, to attack the Nigerian state. The same thing applies to Boko Haram. Somebody has to import the arms, somebody has to fund them, somebody has to instigate them to work. Even if it's against the, 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 against, uh, against, uh, the spirit of, uh, uh, of harmonious uh, uh, coexistence, yet somebody, some, somehow, somewhere, the Nigeria state has to be attacked. I am not a supporter of violence. I'm still repeating that. I am not a supporter of violence. But certain this violence, to an extent, has been justified. To make life better for these youths. Don't give them money. Make them, we, we don't even have the works for them again. Nigeria, Nigeria, Nigeria doesn't have much, much, much work to go around the youths. But I, it's, it's very much possible to provide this youth with some kind of skills acquisition. Those who want to go to school, make it possible for them to go to school. Improve the educational system. Let them go to school, empower their lives. Let them acquire some skills, empower their lives. We can live well for it. It doesn't follow that the West will come and start talking about theorizing on on, 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 on with security approach to peace when the fundamental problem has not been taken care of. It, no matter how much you try to theorize on peace, no matter how much you try to theorize on security approach to, to peace or security measures to guide lives and property of a state, if you don't take care of the fundamental problem, the conflict, the violence will persist somehow. It will only rotate, like it has rotated from the Naya, from the north to, to Niger Delta, from Niger Delta to Southwest, from Southwest back to the north. It will keep going around until you take care of the fundamental problem. Better provide basic infrastructures, grant, grant skills acquisition to these youths, and we will live happily thereafter in peace. That I believe. So I would like to thank you for your inspiring speech. I would like to thank you all for today.